Praise the Lord. Well, while you're standing, I feel the Holy Ghost in here. While you're standing, I'm bringing you brother and sister Lily. They are fresh back from India. And they've had, they've had great success. And uh, I thank God for them being here this morning. And uh, brother, brother Lily, God bless you, bring you and your sweet wife. Come minister to us in the Holy Ghost. Praise God. Can we lift our hands and praise him this morning? Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness. Thank you, Lord, for your mercy and your love. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Anybody here love Jesus this morning? Hallelujah. He is a mighty God, and I'm glad that he is still on the throne and all-powerful. I'm glad to report that he is still reaching down and filling people with the baptism of the Holy Ghost, changing people's lives. You're experiencing revival around here. I think Brother Harper told me you baptized four last week in Jesus' name. Thank God for what God's doing in people's lives. Thank you for the power of the Holy Ghost. I will just give you a prelude a little bit of what happened in India. In the 13 days that we travel from one place to another in seven different locations, over 445 people received the Holy Ghost for the very first time. God poured out His Spirit. God touched people's lives. I am so glad to be alive in the day and time in which I live, in which God is still pouring out His Spirit on people that are hungry. The Bible said, They that hunger and thirst after righteousness shall be filled. If you're hungry for God this morning, if you're thirsty for God this morning, He is no respecter of persons, but here reach down and touch you today, even in this service. One more time, lift your hands and praise the Lord. Hallelujah. We love you, Lord. We worship you and we magnify your name. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I'm so glad Sister Lily was able to make the trip. I told her when we got married last year, I said, I'll take you places you've never been. We've been to 35 different states. We have also, we, we preached 35 weeks in a row. It's 18 states. And now we've been to India together and England together. And, and God's pouring out His Spirit. And I'm so thankful that she has a sensitive mind to obey the voice of God. She spoke five times in India to the ladies in different locations. Powerful moves of the Holy Ghost. And I'm so very, very thankful that God has given her into my life to help me on the last leg of my journey. You may be seated today. Worship the Lord as he testifies and sings this morning. It's so good to be here. We always look forward to being um, at Brother Harper's. And I'm just thankful for all he did in India. I'll probably tell a little bit more about that tonight. But um, it really was a life-changing experience. And I'm just so thankful for his mercy and for the spirit of God that we felt in India is the same spirit of God that we feel here. So just just suppose God searched through heaven and he couldn't find the one willing to be Bye. 
of Jesus and forever for that hallelujah thank you lord 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 hallelujah 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 i leaned over to brother harper and i said to him this morning you know there is a deep moving of the spirit in this building today you might not be shouting and running the aisles, but I have learned throughout the years of living for God, some of the greatest services you could ever be in is when the Spirit of God just comes down and He just sweeps through us and just takes over. And we allow the Holy Ghost to talk to every one of us and we're sensitive to what the Spirit wants to do. We had great outstanding services in India. The crowds weren't as huge as they used to be because the government, they have a new government that is uh, that has taken over and they are cracking down on a lot of Christian outdoor meetings. And uh, so when we were in the tribal village areas, we were able to pretty well have whatever size crowds would come out to here. But in the cities, uh, we had to be confined to an internal building wasn't able to do much on the outside like we have in the years gone by. But we had powerful moves of the Spirit as God reached down and filled people with the Holy Ghost, and they rejoiced in the power of God. The last two services we were in, Brother Harper, it was as if when, when we got up to minister the Word of God and the Spirit of God just began to touch those people. You know, you have a language barrier when you're talking to people that don't speak your language and you don't speak theirs. We just strictly preach through interpreters. But there's something about it when the presence and the power and the Spirit of God comes down and takes over. You don't have to know a universal language of English or Telugu or Indian or Hindi or whatever the nation is. All you need to do is move into the realm of what the Spirit wants to do and how the Spirit wants to talk to you and deal with you. I mean, even as you sit at your pews this morning, you can close your eyes and begin to think about the power of God and the goodness of God. And God can talk to you and God can deal with you and God can touch you and God can change you internally through the power of His Spirit to give you a hope beyond this life into the next life. I was overwhelmed when I looked at this congregation. We love this church. We've known many of you for a long time. Our friendship with Brother Harper goes back many, many, well, several decades. Hallelujah. And I'm so thankful that we had this friendship and that we have our friendship together and the experiences that we've had with God. But I looked out at this congregation this morning, and, and I have to tell you, when you start getting older, you start looking at people a little different than you did when you was young and uh what i see in this what i see in this church building this morning are people that some of you are hungry for the move of god like you used to have in your life hungry for a powerful moving of the spirit of god and a refreshing in the holy ghost like you used to have your refreshings I'm telling you, God is able to reach down and to touch every individual in this building today and supply your every need according to His riches and glory. To give you that peace that passeth all understanding and that joy unspeakable and full of glory. 
that God gave you in years gone by and touched you in years gone by. In our scripture text today, we told Brother Harper we would be preaching from the book of Hebrews chapter 11. I want to read a couple of scriptures and then I just want to talk to you for a little while this morning and what I feel in the spirit. In the book of Hebrews chapter number 11 and verse number 37, it says they were stoned and they were sawn asunder. They were tempted and were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, and tormented. Of whom the world was not worthy, they wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. God, having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. Verse 17 says, They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, and tormented. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in caves, in dens and caves of the earth. I thank you, Lord, for your presence today. I thank you for this congregation. I thank you for every human being that is here to hear the preaching of your word today. I come before you needing you, God, because without you, I am nothing. I could say nothing. I could do nothing. I could be nothing. I've got to have your help, God, to project your word to every individual in this building. Open up our ears to hear and our hearts to receive what the Spirit would say to us in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated today. Praise God. You could take the book of Hebrews chapter 11 and you could preach mighty messages of the powerful faith that these people had in their walk with God and how God delivered and how God touched them miraculously time after time and how God came on the scene in impossible situations and made them possible situations through the power of the Holy Ghost. But then the writer writes uh, for about 35 verses of Hebrews chapter 11. He talks about all the positive attributes and all the positive things that happened to the people that trusted God and depended on God and relied on God. Aren't you glad we have a God that we can trust in and we can depend on and we can rely on? Knowing that God is still in charge of absolutely every situation that we're faced with in life. And that when God decides to do something, God does a great work and a mighty work. And he doesn't have to have our permission to reach down and to do what he wants to do. I'm thankful for what God's doing in Ashbury. The uh, story Brother Harper was telling down in Kentucky of how God is moving on those college students, the people that are hungry for the move of the Spirit of God. I will never forget, as long as I live, about six weeks before Brother J.T. Pugh passed away, I talked to him for a long time on the telephone, and, and I was telling him about what God was doing in India throughout the trips that we had made and how he was reaching down and filling people with the Holy Ghost and people that didn't know anything about God or the power of who who God really is. You know, we are such a privileged people in this country today. Somebody asked me, said, what do you think one of the biggest challenges is to prevent us from having revival in America like we have are seeing around the world and other countries? And I said, to me, if I had to put one word to the reason why that we probably are not having old-fashioned apostolic revival like we used to have is simply affluence. People have become so increased with goods, you know, uh, they have so much anymore that they forgot that it's still a walk by faith. When we came to God years ago, Brother Harper, people were walking by faith, living by faith, trusting God by faith, not depending on their own ideas and their own ingenuity and their own ability to make a living and their own ability to do whatever they needed to do to get by in life, but simply just trusting in God and depending on God. I don't know about you, but after 60 years of living for God, I've still got to trust in God. I've still got to put my faith in God I've just got to understand that he's still God and he's still on the throne and he's still able to reach down and do whatever I need him to do but I want to be hungrier for a move of God and thirstier for a move of God than I've ever been in my life 
And I talked to Brother Pugh, and I'll never forget the words that he said to me. He said, Brother, he said, I believe that uh, God is pouring out his spirit around the world, and God is opening up people's eyes to the fullness of receiving the Holy Ghost. And he said, I'm so thankful for the outpourings of the Spirit of God. But he said, I think the greatest things is about to happen that we have never seen in our life. We're going to see whole denominations, congregations, people coming to God in the power of the name of Jesus Christ and embracing the truth of the fact that there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved that at the name of Jesus Christ, Christ, uh, every knee's going to bow and every toe's going to confess uh, that Jesus Christ is Lord of all. Uh, all powers given in His name. Uh, it's the name that's going to separate. And He said, I believe God uh, is going to open up entire congregations to the truth. Uh, and that's what we're seeing today. We should not downplay what's happening in Kentucky and the other universities that's beginning to have a spiritual awakenings in America. I mean, after all, in Topeka, Kansas, when we refer to the great outpouring in 1901. They were not Holy Ghost filled individuals that knew anything about the truth of the Word of God. They didn't understand the oneness of God. They didn't understand the beautiful truths of baptism in Jesus' name. They were just hungry for a move of God. Is there anybody here today hungry to see the power of God and the move of God like we used to see it and like we want to see it today? He is no respecter of persons. The promise of God is to whosoever will so you got to grab a hold of the promises of God and the trust in God and just simply believe that God is going to do exactly what he said I've heard some great messages in my lifetime of living for God and I heard Jeff Arnold preach a message one time I have never forgotten that message he talked about the fact that we are only armed with one thing just a promise all they had was a promise when they went back to the upper room and they began to pray they didn't have a, a Bible with 66 books in it they didn't have any track record they didn't have any history they were just hungry for a move of God but they had a promise under their arm that if they will wait until they be in due with power from on high and what's coming. I'm telling you, I may not be armed with a lot of things in this life, but I'm armed with the promises of God that he is still going to pour out his spirit and still going to do the supernatural and still going to perform miracles because he is still God. He's still on the throne. He's still the mighty God. And he still wants to reach down in our lives and touch us. Thank God that, the, that God brought us out of darkness into this marvelous light. How privileged we are to be in the marvelous light of the Word of God. It is a privilege to know who he is and who I'm worshiping and who I'm serving tonight. It's still here, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And we need not forget that he's on the throne and he's almighty and he wants to reach down and he wants to answer your prayers and he wants to help you on your journey from here to the glory world. When God filled you with the baptism of the Holy Ghost, he did it because he entrusted to you his power and his spirit. You know, there's a tremendous transformation that takes place when you come to God in the power of of total surrender to him. When you come to an altar of prayer, I tell you what the old timers used to teach. When you come to pray and you come to seek God, you had to clean out your house. You had to get rid of everything that would hinder you in your walk with God and anything that was separating you from the love of God. You needed to clean it up and get rid of it and get a, a, get a vessel that was willing to receive and able to receive the holiness of God. When God fills you with the baptism of the Holy Ghost, you know what he does. He just simply injects part of himself into you. He puts his DNA inside of you. He fills you with his holiness. He fills you with his purity. He fills you with his righteousness. He fills you with his attitude and his spirit. He fills you with the attributes of Christ. Somebody said, well, our mind is not the mind of God. Why shouldn't it be? He said, let this same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. When God fills you with the baptism of the Holy Ghost, he injects you with him inside of you to help you to live for him day by day and to live a life of victory in the, in the eyes and the mind of God. 
Did you know it's the will of God that absolutely everybody in this building today be saved? It's not the will of God for one more person to go to hell. You know, I know it's simple, basic, fundamental preaching. But I'm going to tell you, going to heaven is going to be cheap at any cost. Whatever you have to do to cross the finish line, we've got to be willing to do it. I mean, when they simply preached and told us that we needed to repent of our sins, when we come to the idea and the understanding that that was the first step in our walk with God, it wasn't hard for us to come and ask God to forgive us of our sins with our minds being made up that we're going to do our best to live the way God wants us to live. And God always keeps his end of the bargain. When you repent of your sins, uh, thank God he will forget and wipe the slate clean. Aren't you glad there's a God that re- Reaches down when he forgives you, he forgets your sin and he forgets your mistakes and he gives you a brand new slate every day. You know, the Bible said the mercies of God are fresh every morning. God gives you a fresh start each and every day. God wants to reach down and God wants to wipe that slate clean behind you each and every day as you're making it from here to the glory world. It's the will of God that you be saved. It's the will of God that you be full of the Holy Ghost. It's the will of God that you serve with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, and all your strength. So God fills you with His Spirit, and He enables you with power to overcome the adversary. But if you're going to live for God, and you've got to serve God, you've got to keep your eyes on the goal. The writer said, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of Christ Jesus, pressing on toward the mark with a mind made up that I'm going to do whatever i got to do to live for God and to serve God and to win this race. Whatever I've got to do, whatever sacrifice I've got to make, it's going to be worth it just to cross the finish line and hear him say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. It's going to be worth it all. Hallelujah. But if you're not careful on the way, if you get your eyes off of that goal, you know, we sometimes people want to criticize Peter and talk about how he didn't have faith in walking on the water. But I'm going to tell you something. He walked on the water. He may have only taken two or three steps, Brother Harper, but he walked on the water, and that's more than any of us probably has ever done. Yeah. He trusted God. He simply believed God, but the challenge was when he got his eyes off of Jesus, he started to sink. You've got to keep your eyes on the goal. You've got to keep your eyes on the prize. I'm telling you, the adversary is working around the clock 24-7 to try to do everything he can to detract you in your walk with God, to get your mind off the goal and the objective of crossing the finish line and hearing him say, well done. But I'm telling you, if we've ever needed to have definiteness of purpose, today in our walk with God we need to have it now our minds have got to be made up uh, that we're not just going to serve God every once in a while we're going to serve God every day of our lives Uh, every minute of every day we're going to magnify him in everything that we strive and do because heaven 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 heaven's going to be cheap at any cost and God does not want us to lose sight of the goal That was the challenge that Israel had when they came out of Egypt land. We've all heard the Bible studies. We've all heard it preached on. I don't know how many people, there's so much controversy and with biblical scholars of how many people actually came out. I just know the Bible says there were 600,000 men, and you take the men and the women and the children and you equate all of it together. There was hundreds of thousands of people that came out of Egypt land on their way to the promised land that God gave to them. What should have been a living day journey ended up being 38 years of wandering in the wilderness all because on the way they lost their way on the way they got lost anybody here ever been lost I used to deer hunt a lot when I was a kid growing up and uh, I loved to deer hunt one day I was out hunting and 
got on the back side of the mountain from our property, and we only had about 200 acres of land, but I got lost on that 200 acres. I was sitting watching uh, for deer to come by, and, and it was snowing, and it was winter time, and of course, being raised in western Maryland and Oakland, that's the snow capital of the world. If it's going to snow anywhere, it's going to snow there. And, uh, you know, some years, some years they have documented over 300 inches of snow in Garrett County. And uh, it, it's a snow capital world. I see, I remember they're, they're talking, making pictures of these big mountains of, of snow. I remember when the snow plows used to run and it used to be 30 and 40 feet on each side of the road and just had a one-lane road to get out to go. And that, you know what, back in those days, very seldom did they ever dismiss school. i tell you one of the things about living down in the south now, it can snow in Tupelo and they can have a snowflake and they're set the schools down in Gulfport on the coast. I mean, it's going to snow, you know. Of course, in Mississippi, you got to understand something. From Vicksburg to Meridian, Interstate 20 separates the northern part of Mississippi and the southern part. And the mentality is if, if you live below the Interstate 20, you are a rebel. If you live above Interstate 20, you are a Yankee. And uh, they have a mentality and an idea when it just snows a little bit. They just shut everything down and everything comes to a screeching halt. But in Garrett County, it snowed and, and uh, foot after foot of snow. And, and this particular day, I was out, I was out uh, deer hunting and I sat down for a little while and it snowed. And, and uh, I was, you know, you're having so much fun whenever you're deer hunting. Do you ever think about how stupid you were whenever you were young? Sitting out there in 30 below zero. I mean, it was 30 below zero before they even talked about a wind chill factor back in those days. And we deer hunted until we had icicles running out our nose and on our eyebrows. And, man, ain't we having fun just sitting out here not doing nothing, not even seeing a deer come by because they're smart enough to not get out in that cold weather. They find them a place they can hibernate and stay. And, and you're sitting out there, are we having fun? But I... I, 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 for whatever reason, when I got up to start coming back over the mountain, I got turned around. And, uh, and I started walking, and I started, and you know what? 90 time, 99 times out of 100, when you get lost in the woods, a lot, so often you just make a circle. And, and after a little while, I just come back, and I, so I thought, I've seen that. I've seen that place before, and I was just making circles in that lost condition. And one time, one time I was coming out of Morgantown, and, and uh, I don't know where there was. It used to be a truck stop between Morgantown and Clarksburg, a, a Union 76. And, and uh, uh, we stopped at Cracker Barrel and ate, and, ate and, and uh, of course, I used to drive a truck, so I, uh, I was familiar with that truck stop, and, and uh, we, we would pass by, and I told my wife, I said, that big old truck stop said they're just about, very few of them left. Union 76 is anymore. They're changing to different companies and, and uh, talked about it and went to Cracker Barrel and come out. And, uh, and we started down the road and we had made a little bit of progress. And I looked over to the left and I saw another Union 76. And I said to her, I said, man, I said, I can't believe they have two truck stops within 10 miles of each other, the same name. When I realized I was going north instead of south, and I was going the opposite direction. That's what happens when you get lost. You can get turned around easy. I tell you, people, if you're not careful, you can get turned around in your walk with God easy because you get your eyes off the goal, and you start looking at how the challenges are around you and how difficult it is. There's nothing that you feel any worse than being lost and being uh, to where you don't know which direction you're going and which way you're headed. And, and I'm telling you, that's what happens to a lot of people in their relationship with God. They just simply get lost. They lose their way. They're not sure of where they are. I went to Bible school with a young man. was my roommate. Marvin was a great young preacher. He had a beautiful future ahead of him. And, and uh, he could get up in chapel, and he was one of the favorite preachers on, uh, on Wednesdays and we had, when, when we had chapel at Bible school. And, and uh, he was a good preacher, and, and everything was going on the up and up with him. And and uh, he come out of a good church, and, and, it, and it appeared as if he had a great, bright future. And he graduated from PBI and, and uh, married a young lady out of Brother uh, Ursus Church in Indianapolis. And she was in Bible school. Him and Shirley got married. And, 
and uh, God blessed them with two children, and everything was on the up and up in his life, and and uh, they moved back to Michigan, and and uh, she they hadn't lived there but less than uh, three or four years, and God had blessed them with two children, and and uh, Marvin uh, uh, had had a job as a, uh, a EMT uh, uh, ambulance driver, and uh, uh, Shirley developed a brain tumor, and and life. Life began to happen, and challenges begin to happen, and the doctor bills begin to build up, and 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 instead of drawing closer to God, instead of being more in tune with God, instead of being more faithful to God, let me tell you what: when you're going through challenges in life and difficulties in life, this is still the refuge where you can come to and you can find the hope and the answers and the strength and the comfort that you need. There's nothing like it when you're caught up in the cares of this life, and it seems like nothing is going right, then for you to darken the doors of an apostolic church and come into a place of refuge where the peace of the Holy Ghost can touch you and God can strengthen you and God can refresh you and God can renew you. There's nothing like the house of God. Let me just inject right here, and I'm not trying to pastor, but I'm just trying to just tell you something that I see one of the biggest challenges with this COVID-19 mess that come to this country for a couple of years was people got so used to the Internet and got so used to uh, seeing the services on the Internet that they thought that they could sit at home and they could what? There's nothing wrong with being able to hear the Word of God like that, but there's nothing any greater than to get up and get dressed and come to the house of God and sit on a Pentecostal pew and and worship with your brothers and sisters in the power. There's something about the continuity of your walk with God when you're doing it together. This is the rest wherein the weary can come to rest. This is a house of refuge. This is where you need to come. And so when difficulties happen in life, don't just don't start staying away from church. Come more to the house of God than you've ever come before and be more faithful than you've ever been because God's going to bless you for your faithfulness and your dedication and your consecration. It's the will of God that you cross the finish line. Remember, it's the will of God that you be saved. But life just happened to Marvin and, and one thing after another and the doctor bills mounted up and the hospital bills mounted up and his wife had a brain tumor and they had to do surgery and, and miraculously they got it all and God blessed but the bills was overwhelming and, and instead of coming more faithful to church, Marvin took a second job. Let me tell you something, there's nothing wrong with trying to provide with your family because that's the will of God but you don't need to let things come between you and your ability to have a little bit of time to come to the house of God to get the strength that you need and the help that you need. Nothing like the house of God. I want to reiterate that time after time. There's nothing like coming to the house of God and getting your soul fed through the power of the Holy Ghost. So he justified his working two jobs. He missed Sunday morning and, and, and before long uh, his job interfered and he missed Sunday night and 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 uh, and 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 he would try to come on Wednesdays, but but uh, he would undoubtedly get called out or something would happen. He was a policeman uh, in the daytime and, and still drove an ambulance at night and tried to make ends meet and and, and his spirituality began to waver and he began to grow a little cold and and he began to lay out a church and it wasn't important to be there he had to do something to pay his bills and, and before long Marvin just lost his way his 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 wife kept going to church, took her two children to church, stayed faithful to, stayed faithful to the church, and, and Marvin just got further and further and further. I mean, he, I, I've seen Marvin when he would shout and when he would rejoice and when God used him mightily and anointed in our chapel services and, and a great move of God and a great experience with God, but he just lost his way. He got caught up in life and he got his eyes off the goal. And he couldn't seem to make enough money with what he was doing, and so he started selling drugs on the side. Then he lost his job as a policeman in Detroit, Michigan, and, and, and Shirley begging him to go to church, and, and the kids crying when they went 
when dad wouldn't go to church with them, and now they were five, and six, seven years old, and Marvin just went from bad to worse. He just lost his way. And one day he, one day he drove up to a motel, and he went in, and he robbed the motel owner, and he came out, and as he walked down the sidewalks, a young couple was coming up the sidewalk as he was going back to his car, and they saw his face, and Marvin panicked. Brother Harper, he just lost his way. He just went berserk, and he killed both of them right there on the sidewalk. Apostolic preacher just lost his way. Now two life sentences behind the bars. Never going to get out, never going to have freedom again in his life. His wife's still living for God. Raised those two kids on her own. Kept her eyes on the goal, Brother Harper. And both of those kids became missionaries to Russia. Amers, UPC Amers, Williams's. Mama kept her eyes on the goal, but Marvin just lost it. He just lost his way. I guess if I have a message for you today, I just feel this in my spirit. That, that there's some in this building today that are floundering in their walk with God. and they're, they're just going through the motions and they're not really feeling like they used to felt in the walk with God. And they're not really where they know that they need to be. And they're just sort of just living it day by day and just surviving day by day. But along the way they have lost their way. And they really don't know which way to turn. I'm telling you, there's a God in the house this morning that wants to touch you and wants to strengthen you and wants to help you and wants to refresh you and wants to renew you and wants you to get your eyes back on Him. After all, He said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. You need to look up to Him. He's the author and the finisher of our faith. He's the only answer that can help you in the situations that you find yourself in day by day. We've told you the story when we were here before and, and my wife here was married uh, for uh, 30, how many years? 28 years, 28 years to Mike. And Mike Mike was a classic example of a Pentecostal brother Harper that just that just had every opportunity in the world. The first convert Kenny Godair ever had in his church in Burlington and prayed him through. And you know what? There's something about that when you think about people that you prayed through years ago. You know, one of the greatest things that I experienced in India this time we would go to places and and we would have a couples come up to us or older older people now come up to us and say, you know, they told Sister Lily said, you know, 19 years ago, brother Sister Lily came here and they prayed for us. We didn't have children. We'd been married 10 years, didn't have kids, and they prayed for us and said, so we want to show you what God did. And they'd bring their 17 year old son and daughter up to us and say, this is the answer that God gave us 17 years ago when you prayed 19 years ago. And you know, there's something to say about people that continue on in the continuity of their walk with God and and people who came up one lady said you know said said uh, said brother lily came into our into my house 15 years ago to pray for me with a thyroid condition and god healed me and she said i still have never had any problems from that day to this because the miraculous power of god touched me there's something to be said about converts that have prayed through in the years gone by that you see and it was precious for Mike to have got the Holy Ghost under Brother Godair. And he become his sound man. And he said, and he listened, listen. He listened to some of the greatest apostolic preaching. I mean, Johnny Godair, Kenny Godair, old Brother Booker Law, and, and, and all these, Brother Urshan, and all these guys that have come through there. He heard preaching after preaching after preaching. But something happened in the life of Mike. He just lost his way. He went through the motions. It's not enough, church, to go through the motions. You got to get it down here. You got to keep it refreshed down here. You got to keep it renewed down here. You got to stay on fire for God every day with your own individual life. You've got to stay prayed through. You got one of the finest. Did, uh, you don't have to give me anything extra in the offering. You got one of the finest apostolic preachers in Pentecost. Yeah. 
I pale in comparison to his intelligence. Where he went to Harvard University, I just went to kindergarten. You got a great pastor. I'll just say that. See, I didn't, I, you know, you know what I'm talking about. I mean, he's a great, you've heard some of the greatest preaching. This church, this, this church. I just preached to you out of my heart. This church ought to be full. Every pew, if you just had 10% of the people that have sat and rejoiced in this church in the past 50 years, wouldn't hold a balcony be full. But you know what I see? I see empty pews, Brother Harper. And I see just souls that lost their way. Be careful. Be careful. Don't lose your way. Mike heard the greatest preaching, the greatest conviction. Sister Linda Lily played me a tape of her husband a week before he left this world, and he talked about the miraculous power of God that has done such a miracle work in a lady's life that he said, I personally saw for myself the great power of God when God healed her like I've never seen before, a week before he killed himself. What happened to Mike? He just lost his way. Don't lose your way, saints. Man, woman, mother, father, son, daughter this morning in this church, if you're floundering in your walk with God, don't put it off too long to get back with God. Don't lose your way. Along with that losing your way, spirits that get a hold of you, that you never dreamed would ever get a hold of you. Bitterness, discouragements, unbelief. Israel lost their way for 38 years. They wandered all because a spirit of unbelief got a hold of them at Katie Sparnia. And they failed to go forward when they knew they should. Lost. So for 38 years, they wandered in circles. One scripture that stands out to me so forcibly in the Bible was when they finally got ready. God finally told them, now it's time for you to go into Canaan's land. You wandered long enough. You know, they wandered 38 years, and they sat at the foot of the mountain for two years. And, and Moses penned Deuteronomy and capped the history of Israel up to that point of going over into Canaan's land. 38 years, God said, you've walked around this mountain long enough. You've got to get your sense of direction straightened out. You've got to go forward. I'm going to tell you something this morning, saints. You've got to go forward. You've got to press toward the mark. You've got to get your minds set on the goal. You've got to be determined that you're going to cross the finish line. You've got to be determined that you're going to serve God. You've got to be determined that come what may, I'm going to live for God. I'm going to serve God. Mike just lost his way. Brother Godair preached his funeral. Hard funeral to preach. The first convert. All you could do is leave him in the hands of a just God. But knowing all along, they just lost their way. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Is it just me or is there a super presence of the Lord right now in this building? Right now. God's. God's got your attention right now. And God says, you don't have 
to fall by the wayside. You don't have to be lost. Capture the vision of crossing the finish line. Get a hold of that renewed vision that Jesus Christ really cares and really wants to help you. Today, under the sound of my voice, there's someone who walked in this building this morning saying in their minds, this will be the last time I come to church. But you don't need to lose your vision. Calvary. He's here to touch you. All it takes is one touch. All it takes is one touch. Jesus said, who touched me? And I wondered this morning at the close of this service if, if he will stand in the balconies of heaven and say, who touched me this morning? Who reached out for me this morning? Who decided that they was going to do everything in their power to live for me today? As we sit under the presence of the Lord that we can feel this morning in such a wonderful way, listen to the words of this chorus as she sings it. touch. You need a fresh renewing. I'm telling you on this Sunday morning, February the 19th, 2023, Jesus stands at the door and says, come unto me all ye that are heavy and labor, and I'll give you rest this morning. Altars are open. Anyone that might want to pray, this is your opportunity. Just keep your eyes. They just lost their way, but you don't have to be lost. He's here to give you direction today. Ilalalamoria. 